morning, everybody. Um, my name is Alexei Furman, and I'm, um, I started my career as a photojournalist, and then I started working with um, various innovative means uh, for storytelling. And basically, my talk today is going to be predominantly about the virtual reality documentary that we have created called Aftermath the Art of Maidan. So, as a photojournalist, I covered the events of the Euromaidan revolution, the annexation of Crimea, and the, the war in East Ukraine. And I remember very vividly a moment that happened uh, as we were covering the so-called referendum in the, in the so-called DNR. Um, and I was with a group of um, American, Spanish, British photojournalists who were also covering with me. And, um, as as we were as we were talking to people who were who were sitting there um, and sort of discussing photography and with with co coverage in in the DNR um, at the in May 2014, like a lot of people didn't believe who you were and like it was all very sketchy. And uh, my American colleague said, "Well, I'm a photographer and cameras don't lie." And uh, when I think about this moment, you know, I I really. Um, I really wish a time machine existed because I really want to add yes, but people do. Um, so um, it's not by any means any kind of um, scholarly um, find, but um, I was I was talking image manipulation to my students, and um, and I taught in photojournalism at universities, and um, so I. As, as a practitioner, I think mostly manipulation happens when the image is being created, um, when the image is being edited or post-processed, or when the image is contextualized. So when the, when the photograph is used in, um, in any kind of media environment. So a couple examples, I think examples are always fun. So um, one of the first, uh, really one of the first image manipulations in history is a very famous um, photo by Roger Fenton. Um, he was a British photojournalist covering uh, the war in Crimea, in Ukraine. Um, and, um, well, he basically arranged cannonballs um, in the field uh, near, um, um, well, somewhere in Crimea. I don't, I don't think it matters for, um, for this occasion. Um, anyways, um, back then, the sort of, um, the relationship between documentary photography and reality hasn't really been established yet. Like, you would, you would see, I haven't included this, but the photographers who covered the, um, the American Civil War of the mid 19th century, they arranged bodies on the field. So, you know, um, and it's by any means, now it's, no one ever does that. Even, even you know, people who are really evil don't do that anymore, but back then it was okay. So um, this is one cool example, and um, it's easily proven by another photograph that he has. Like you can clearly see the, um, the cannonballs on the upper photograph being being laid on the on the road, and on the bottom photograph they're not there anymore. Like a person really was walking around and um, moving these cannonballs. And this one is really cool. And this is another example, um, Arthur Rothstein, um, and uh, a guy was um, covering the drought in America, and uh, he was uh, he was basically traveling with the skull. Like he would place the skull. In different in different places, making a making a statement that there is a drought. So, well, that is that is um, also sort of unimaginable. And yes, this is another example how a manipulation is being created when the image is being created. So there is no image yet, but the manipulation is sort of already there. And this is a this is a newer example. I always love the the situations that happen to World Press Photo, like. They never end. It seems every year there's some spot going on, and this is an Italian photographer, Giovanni Troilo, um, and I mean he's he has a cool portfolio. Like the guy, the guy shoots advertising and stuff, and it's it looks really good. But then he applied his series to the World Press photo, and he was making a claim that this is reality. Well, it turned out he asked his cousin to have sex in the car, and he lit that with a, with a flashlight, and he said that was reality. So the mayor of that city wrote an email to World Press photo saying, "Hey, this is not." actually something that is going on in our city. And the guy was like, oh yeah, mm, okay. And at first, World Press Photo was like, no, you know, th you know that's okay. And then the, everyone was like, what? And so um, finally, uh, they decided to pull that uh, from, their winning, uh, from their winning roster. But um, also, 
and there were a couple other situations that I haven't included because of the lack of time where they haven't pulled as serious, although there was a clear manipulation was um, uh, happening on this level. Um, so anyways, and this is um, uh, a very famous disappearing, the disappearing the job. Like in here you clearly see how, um, how the Soviet, um, Soviet propaganda was um, sort of manipulating imagery depending on whether this person was okay to be featured in the photograph or not and when Yezhov uh, was uh, executed in 1940 he was obviously not someone who should have appeared um, in a photograph so they so they pulled him off from the photograph and that's that is often, um, this photograph is often referred to as the vanishing commissar, which I think is uh, kind of amazing. And a lot of th things like this, a lot of like photoshopped smoke, like you look at this, it's 2006, and you look at this today and you're like, seriously, um, you decided to photoshop smoke? And it looks really bad, I mean, um, I, today I wouldn't even believe it, but it was the early days of, um, of digital image manipulation, um, so it was it was used. You would find a couple examples like this. There was another one with rockets flying out of something like Prad um, or similar uh, launchers, um, and a couple more. Um. And this is like a bonus. This is everything. Like a lot going on um, in this um, very famous photograph. I was surprised. I was googling raising the flag because I was looking for I Iwo Jima. And I was googling raising the flag over, and actually over Rick Stark was above in Google than Iwo Jima speaking about uh, search algorithms um, that we uh, touched on yesterday. And in here, not only this, um, not only this image is orchestrated or organized, but also um, several watches that. Um, were on the on the arm of the soldiers were then uh, post processed and also small added. So a lot going, a lot um, going on in this one, and so um, I guess with with the first one or or the second one, you can um, you can sort of you can sort of get to the to the bottom of things in the end. But really today, I think one of the most dangerous um, ways of how images are manipulated is just using the image outside of, of context. So um, this um, extremely famous photo of Ron Habib that won a world press um, at the end of 1990s was used by a pro-Russian Vkontakte group um, to say, hey, save the bus from Ukrainian army. Um, and when I look at it, I immediately know this is Ron Habib because this is an image that I've seen in books and, and in the internet hundreds of times, but people don't. And people don't Google it afterwards. People don't have thirty seconds to, to check it, you know. So, um, so yeah, this is this is not this is not the best Ukraine. But um, Russian uh, propaganda was um, smart in a way where they would choose the photographs where people who actually don't know these photographs and don't know the environment really well would um, would think that this kind of looks like you know this kind of looks like Ukraine and. Um, you know, looks poor, and the the cars that you see are old. So you know, might have might have also been done bust. And this, I think, I, I haven't really I haven't really seen this example, but I was fascinated by the fact how you know how far can people go? It's like the the he the Russian headline says that um, there's a lot of there's more and more, and this is from March two thousand fourteen, um, while the Crimea uh, was being um, annexed by Russia, and. It says a lot, a lot, uh, and more and more Ukrainians are arriving to the, to the south regions of Russia. And when you look at this image, I think it says Shuhini. Mm -hmm. So it's like there is an indicator there, and if you just take this name and put it inside Google, you're you're gonna see that this is a, a border <coughs> control point between Ukraine and Poland. It's like how far can people go? Um, and so. With with photographs, it's it's sort of I I always think of photographs as these like building blocks because every photo story consists of like many building blocks. Like every photographs is like a building block on its own, 
But then a lot more dangerous things can happen when um, building blocks and also a flow of imagery, so video, um, can be used to create whole new narratives. Um, I, I, I want to show this, although it's like two and a half minutes, but I think it's really great. Uh, so this is one of my favorite uh, myths that was, create, that was created by Russian uh, state propaganda about um, the Euromaidan revolution. And basically, um, they are making a claim that the trees on Institutska Street, where the shooting happened on 20th of February 2013, were cut to show, to sort of hide where the bullet holes were. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain why this is simply not true. Одна из важных деталей, которую мы заметили в центре Киева – спиленные деревья, только что живые, не сломанные, не сгоревшие. От них остались лишь корневища. И это именно те деревья, в которые попали или могли попасть снайперские пули во время стрельбы по демонстрантам и сотрудникам Беркута в феврале. И именно эти стволы – явные улики, по которым эксперты могли бы определить, откуда стреляли по институтской улице. Уже понятно, что так называемое дело снайперов станет одной из главных тем предвыборной повестки на Украине. И, судя по всему, игра уже началась, следствие не закончено, но оглашаются промежуточные итоги расследования. Украинская прокуратура, которую возглавляет представитель националистической партии «Свобода», официально заявила, на Институтской улице, переименованной в улицу Небесной Сотни, стреляли бойцы подразделения «Беркут» по приказу Януковича. Есть задержанные. Но те, кого новая власть обвиняет в расстрелах, сегодня уверяют, дело сфабриковано. И национальной трагедии, унесшей жизни более ста человек, пытаются воспользоваться для оправдания государственного переворота. Мой коллега Юрий Липатов разбирался, что же произошло на Институтской. Нынешние власти на Украине подошли к моменту, когда уже невозможно молчать на тему расследования об инициаторах бойни на улице Киева. Но перед тем, как заговорить, решили уничтожить некоторые вполне очевидные улики. Спилив, например, деревья на улице Институтская, которую сейчас еще стали называть улицей Небесной Сотни. Бывшие бойцы Беркута, хорошо знающие всю важность улик для расследования, задают вопрос, зачем это было сделано. Деревья эти были важны, потому что являлись материальным подтверждением наиболее убедительной версии февральских событий, когда некие снайперы начали убивать и протестующих, и милиционеров. Но даже достаточно поверхностный анализ видеозаписи, сделанных на улице Киева, показывает, откуда именно велась стрельба. Из гостиницы «Украина», также, очевидно, с крыши дома номер 7 по улице Институтская и из здания «Аркада Банка». Все здания в тот момент находились под контролем боевиков Майдана. А оператор, снимавший вот это видео, наверняка знал, когда именно и в кого именно попадут пули. Действия снайперов и снимавших убийства были скоординированными. Видимо, управлялись из одного центра. Об этом свидетельствует и записанный разговор. Уже другая видеозапись, на которой видно, что пули активистов Майдана, прячущихся за счетами, летят не со стороны бойцов Беркута, а наоборот, со спины, где, по идее, находится свои. Стреляет не очень-то метко. Вот пуль попадает в дерево, где след от попадания. Он тоже от выстрела со стороны, где находятся те же самые свои. Именно поэтому, очевидно, деревья и были просто спилены в срочном порядке. So, what happens here is um, they use documentary footage um, that is true and then they add a lot of info that is not true but also the worst thing that you can do and they obviously know it um, with capturing reality um, is a very close like this could have been sh could have could have been shot in the view like anywhere they are trying to at least stick to truth, so it is really shot in Kiev, and it is really shot in Institutska. But when you look at this, you finally see, I mean, you could, you could use Google Street to, you to sort of understand that even earlier, but in this, in this frame, you can see the National Bank of Ukraine. 
and National Bank of Ukraine is about 150 meters, 200, from the place where the shooting happened. And this is, I've, I've used Google Maps yesterday, this is 350 meters from where the shooting happened. Like, there was nothing, and I, I know most of the footage that was created, and I know what happened, and who was standing where, and, and I'm, I'm crazy about 20th of February now, and there was nothing going on here. So, the trees that were cut are completely irrelevant, and, um, you know, this myth is sort of being dragged together to, um, yeah, to manipulate uh, what people think. But also, there is one interesting and quite important thing going on here. Um, so, if you don't know Kiev, and if you don't know what happened, you look at this and you're like, wow, they did this 3D reconstruction, it sort of makes sense. But this is the, the house that is called the Cabinet of Ministers, and it was not controlled by the Euromaidan protesters because the main barricade was here, and the, actually it was controlled by the police, and the police was shooting uh, from this direction. So this whole sort of confusion um, about the Euromaidan revolution specifically, and the 20th of February in, in particular, um, led us to a, a desire to do something about it that would actually explain what had happened, at what time, um, who, who was where, when, and stuff like that. And um, put, put that all, the main thing is that, put that all in context. So somehow use some medium to in-depthly explain people um, what had actually happened. And um, let me see if this, if this pulls. No. So, when I was studying um, at Missouri School of Journalism, I, as a New York Times subscriber, received something that was called a Google Cardboard. And it was a very simple, very like easy to use virtual reality headset that is made from cardboard. And there was one film called The Displaced. It was a 360 video, 360 film. And it featured three stories um, from various corners of the world in the format of 360 video. And I, the first story is that is there is a story from Ukraine. I think this is totally plain in Sapphire right now, sorry. So, using 360 video, I thought, you could show a lot more because it's not a flat frame anymore. Like, the, the, the really the problem with all this all this manipulation was that the frame was flat and especially if you're using telephoto frames like the frames that are really close you can say whatever you want but 360 video seemed to be a tool where you could place a camera and then a person would be able to look around and make the decisions and the conclusions for himself or herself or being guided inside this very wide frame that is that is practically a sphere um, so, 360 video was, was something that we be began with um, in our studio, and we did a couple of small um, and we did a couple of small multimedia projects with Radio Free Liberty and New York Times and Al Jazeera and whatnot. But then we started looking into six degrees of freedom VR, so VR where you could actually move around, and. As I've said, we really had this desire to tell the story of February the 20th, which was not only an important story to tell, but for us it was an, a personal story, because both uh, the director of the project, Sergei Polozhaka, and myself, we were um, covering the Euro Maidan revolution um, every, almost every day. And this, this led to the project that we um, called Aftermath VR Euro Maidan. So what, so what have we actually decided to do? 
So the first idea that we um, that we uh, that we had in our head was actually AR, um, and uh, we we had an idea to do a cell phone AR application where people would come to Institutska Street themselves and hold a phone in their hand, and be they would be able to walk around Institutska Street and see the flat images um, or three D artifacts or interviews with people. But then we realized that this idea was very limiting because. Um, it, People who, who would be able to experience this um, this project would only be people who would um, come to Kiev physically. So we decided to uh, move it into a virtual reality space. Um, never do that. Um, it's it's you know there was there was there was a piece of reality that we could use, and then we decided to make it virtual. And it's a decision that we took simply because we wanted the project to travel um, to travel across locations, but. Um, really, um, reality would have been a different story, but also a powerful one. Um, so we decided to do photogrammetry, and photogrammetry is a technique that um, has been allowing um, video game creators and architects to visualize in 3D something that is real, something that exists. So um, it's rarely used to um, to do big things, but we decided to adhere to photogrammetry to scan a huge chunk of downtown Kiev, so move the reality into virtual reality. And then in this three-dimensional model, while the viewers are inside this model, um, use flat photographs to, um, to tell the story of what happened. And also um, conduct 360 video interviews with eyewitnesses where they would, um, where they would tell their personal stories. And use um, use a voice narration um, to guide you through um, what is going on, and also have some artifacts, things that were um, present, material things like shields, gloves, uh, helmets, and things like that um, in the scene to sort of immerse the viewers into the scene even more. So we funded this through. Um, an initiative called Journalism 360, and it was um, a grant that was pulled together by Google News Initiative 9 and ONA, and that was 2017, and in 2018 we held a Kickstarter campaign. Also, if you ever have an idea of doing Kickstarter for a VR project, hard, uh, but we managed to um, raise additional $10,000 to complete this project. So in the end, uh, that, that was a lot of talking, um, how it looks like. so. The first groups of Euromaidan protesters reached the pedestrian bridge, the bridge in front of you. The remains of raised barricades, stones, and other refuse are everywhere. So as you've, as you've seen, you are um, a person that um, comes to Institutska Street. So speaking about a real experience that um, it can be compared with, you're a person that comes to Institutska Street today and you are holding a bunch of um, real photographs in your hands that you can easily um, compare to the real world environment around you. And time. Uh, Timeline-wise, you are retracing the path of the protesters. So, you start at about 8:55 um, a.m. when the um, police forces started going up the street, um, and then you follow. You follow the. You're sort of always in this project. You're always on the front line with the uppermost protesters, with the protesters that were brave enough to be on the on the front line of this um, really war warlike situation. Um, and um, and you are witnessing um, through through the narrative how police opened live ammunition fire at the protesters. So, a couple things about how it all how it all works. So, um, photogrammetry really is a cool tool that can be applied to many things. Um, it really, for most people, it works with smaller objects. So, this is an example of how. Um, a shield is created, the, the, the stages that it go through, so uh, first there are photographs and then you put them in special software and it sort of matches the points and then it creates 
a very, a very um, unoptimized model. And then basically it goes through um, processes to optimize it to, uh, so we could in the end use it inside the game engine where we put it all together. And uh, this, is the, this is the chunk of um, downtown Kyiv that we scanned. And this is a, a, a pretty early um, drone scan that we did, like a foundation for um, all the other works that we have done. Um, it's, um, it's one of the biggest high quality three dimensional models that I have experienced in VR. Uh, not necessarily cannot be compared to modern video games where you have huge levels, and, uh, but you, can also, you, you cannot also compare the budget of a video game to a budget of a document. Project. Um, so how we how we worked with um, with archival material, how we worked with flat footage ourselves. There is this um, synchronization of all the footage that was taken, um, made on Institutska in this time frame, put together by the activists and the lawyers of the families of the Heavenly Hundred, uh, the um, hundred people who um, who died. Um, during the Euromaidan revolution. And um, so how it works, it's... Uh <laughs> timer in the left bottom, <coughs> in the left top corner, and all the footage that is there was synchronized by sound and all other means possible, so um, this is really everything that was, um, except for a couple, I think, videographers they couldn't identify, because there were a lot of foreign freelancers coming to, um, to capture the events, and this is all of the footage that was um, uh, made on and then we um, then we laid it out as a foundation um, in Premiere, and then we um, we didn't need that much footage ourselves. We just needed enough footage to tell the story, um, and uh, we had nine photographers, three videographers, and three or four media outlets donating their footage to us uh, to use for free in our project, and including. Uh, photographers and videographers who really were on the front lines, um, and uh, we 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 um, we were able to place the footage that we had in in a t in a time frame uh, because of this work, <coughs> massive work that has been that has been already done by um, a group called Talionis, um, and this is um, an, a, a screenshot of how we how we did the interviews. So we used a 360 video camera, a rig of GoPros pretty simple one, um, to capture the, the eyewitness um, recollections of these events. And this is Ivan Rapovi, um, a protester who almost dies. He was severely wounded near the upper exit from the Khrushchev subway. And this is the only double interview, although you, 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 don't, see his, um, um, you don't see the other guy. But um, this, this is the double interview that is the final interview, and this is Ivan, a protester and a medic who saved his life by holding his hand for 40 minutes on his wound. So we thought um, an interview where sort of life goes on was um, a, good, um, a good interview to um, finish the experience with. And this is, um, this is an example, 360 video in an equirectangular fashion always looks crappy, and this is another example of it looking crappy and what? Why is it so white? Um, so um, this is this is basically how um, how the interviews are organized. So people are standing in the places that were significant uh, for them in that morning. And this is um, Sergei Mirchuk, who is now um, um, who actually, after being a Euromaidan protester in a new uh, government, went to work for the Rivne police. Um, and this is on the left. You can see a monument, a make sort of a makeshift monument to um, his friend who was killed, um, and he he witnessed that. So this is how it looks like in the game engine. Um, there is a yellow line, um, sort of um, augmented reality inside virtual reality. 
um, a yellow line that guides you so you don't lose yourself. Um, we couldn't really do much in terms of level design, conventional game level design, because the level is already there and we cannot really make changes to it. Um, although level design wise it's, and, um, it's, not, it's not great and people get lost. Um, the beginning part where they go up the street is fine, but then when they have to like cross this, the bridge and then walk by the, the big yellow building that is called October Palace, people, people get a little lost, but uh, we, couldn't, yeah, we couldn't alter the reality. And this is a scene, um, a, sc a screen grab from a game engine, how it, um, how it looks like. And uh, the, challenge, the challenge with projects like, like, like ours for any kind of institution or organization is that it requires a multidisciplinary team. And multidisciplinary teams are something very rare and something rare to find. Like you, you have to put them together um, and make them talk to each other. Uh, journalists talk to developers and 3D artists talk, talk to photogrammetry experts. And um, you know, journalists become the art directors and a lot of good things are happening, but um, these, these teams are hard to put together, hard to make them talk to each other. Um, although they speak the same language, but they don't in a way. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge and these teams are not easily put together and not easily found. Um, and um, so just uh, to kind of clear up confusions, although I'm, I'm sure you, um, you got most of what I said, but um, sometimes I read that our project is a reconstruction of the events of the 20th of February and it's not a reconstruction, so it's not a time machine. As I said, you come to Institutska today with a bunch of photographs if you compare that to your real experience. So um, it's not a time machine. You don't get to travel back in time. You don't get to see the police. You don't get to see the protesters right by you running. So it's not a Call of Duty game. Uh, it's, it's more of a museum in a virtual reality. Um, and uh, my favorite slide, um, let's see, let's, uh, let's see if you're gonna smile. Uh, so um, one of the most, favorite, mo most pop popular questions and my favorite one that I get asked is, can I throw a Molotov cocktail in your experience? <laughs> yes. Okay, so, um, and my answer is no, although that, that sounds fun uh, for a video game, but um, our project is not about uh, throwing Molotov cocktails. Clearly, it's more um, a, a museum experience that is very calm in uh, de deconstructing myths created by um, Russian propaganda. Um, so, uh, that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. And now we move on to Jean Bogiev. Uh, oops. And the title of his presentation is Mixed Reality, Potential and Pitfalls for Representing History. And we need a few minutes or seconds, actually, to connect. Um, hi everyone. <coughs> so, um, yeah, uh, as Bola said before, so I'm, I'm from the University of Luxembourg and I'm the head of the VR and AR lab. So, we look into mixed reality and um, extended reality technologies. And um, as such, uh, a brief disclaimer before I start the talk so, I'm not a historian. Okay. So, my, my background is in computer science and media studies. And um, I'm here basically to give you a, um, a bit of background on what's technically possible and what we're working on so that you get a feel on what you can actually do and maybe what you can't do yet, okay? Um, so uh, it is slightly technical, I try to keep it on the minimum level necessary, so there are some processes that I describe, but okay. So um, starting with mixed reality, actually, um, I would like to discuss this uh, so-called virtual reality continuum. Um, that's been coined by, by a researcher called Milgram and Kishino, and basically the virtual reality continuum is everything that's between the real environment, so you see a small picture of a kitchen, right, this is, a, this is the reality, and the virtual uh, corresponding um, uh, version of that would be, could be captured by photogrammetry for instance, but that would be actually 3D objects and a fully virtual environment, okay? And so in between this, there's also something called augmented reality, where you take the um, real environment and you augment it by placing virtual or digital objects, like this kind of robot here. 
But then there's also coming from the other side, you have a fully virtual environment and you could enrich this with uh, real objects. Like here there's a vase on the table, the candle in the background, etc. So these are real objects, okay? And now, just to, uh, to kind of um, show you where I'm, I'm, or what I'm talking about, mixed reality is actually everything in between real and virtual. So it's not fully virtual, like Alexei, um, uh, in his experience, uh, but it's also not real only. And just for completion, uh, the virtual reality continuum plus, if you like, there's also something very interesting that might have potential also for, for historic representations. It's called diminished reality. And that's basically, if you take reality and you remove things, right? It's a bit like the picture manipulations that we heard before when, the, when some, some uh, cannonballs are so removed. So in diminished reality, for instance, here I removed um, this vase, uh, the flowers on the table, right? It's actually, there's quite impressive works on this where, I mean, a lot of you are probably using Photoshop where you just have a small, small thingy, uh, it's a tooltip, and you remove stuff, and people are gone from the beach and you're alone and everything looks great. <laughs> you can do this in real time on video. So basically, if I take the phone, right, and I, I zoom this, and this table might look clean. So there's a lot of potential there, and uh, something that all of you probably use these days are noise cancelling uh, headphones. That is also diminished reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, and people are working towards filtering selectively, so you could filter specific people and hear the voices of others. <laughs> All right, so I, I think this is important, so I want to comment on that. And this is, this is uh, diminished reality and virtual um, reality. If you take that, that is called mediated reality, okay? But here on this talk, I focus on mixed reality and mostly on augmented reality. Um, in a way, augmented virtuality is the inverse of that, so the problems are similar, yet uh, you come from a different perspective. So, um, just a brief history of that. Um, so, the idea of um, conveying rich experiences by combining reality and virtual objects is not new, right? Actually, um, this has been researched for many, many decades, and one of the first prototypes uh, that you see here is the Sword of Damocles, and that basically can be coined the world's first head-mounted display. Um, about the term augmented reality is from early 90s, so that was coined much, much earlier. But this is um, actually work of uh, Ivan Sutherland from uh, Harvard. And um, maybe you see, so you have this head-mounted display. Some of you might be familiar with uh, the less cumbersome uh, versions of today. But they're mounted to this kind of stuff that's mounted on the roof. And this is tracking your movement, right? They didn't have like inbuilt sensor X yet, but this is really mechanical. But it was the first of its kind. And then moving from this really cumbersome uh, local technology, um, for instance, in the early 90s, after the uh, term uh, augmented reality was coined, there was this Karma project. And that's the first, if you like, knowledge-driven AR application <coughs> where um, a user with a head-mounted display could uh, see overlaid uh, instructions for maintaining, for instance, printers here. Okay? And uh, also at Columbia University, a couple of years later, um, they developed this first mobile outdoor system called Turing Machine. And that's getting pretty close to what you experience today. It's basically uh, not that you wear a rucksack and an HMD, but you see that this, this person is outside and seeing like an overlay on reality with some information on the environment. And basically that's uh, leading us to today. So this is a very brief history of, of AR because there's lots of steps in between. But what you have here is like one of the most common scenarios um, and that is like mobile navigation, right? So um, if you have uh, your mobile device, and um, there's usually now AR modes, and you see that basically on top of the real image, also perspectively correct, there's an overlay that gives you contextual information. Now, um, the applications today, and there's lots of um, research going into the different applications, are mostly like navigation as I saw it, but then you have like construction and maintenance, so where you have like um, your workers that get information. Uh, well, advertising is obviously, um, people see a big market, it can be extremely annoying uh, if you just have like, you know, advertisements patched virtually on stuff. Education and training is more the domain we work at, also entertainment and gaming if you like. Um, and then there's also medical use. And these are civil applications, so I'm not, I'm, I'm limiting entirely the military applications like, you know, jet pilots seeing uh, augmented reality information, okay? <clears throat> and um, I think that navigation, um, education, and entertainment are probably the, the sectors that are most interesting also for representing history. And um, my plan is now to give you two examples of current projects. Um, 
where augmented reality is used to convey um, historical um, information and or kind of immersive interactive media experiences. And the first um, project that I have um, here, let me see, there we go, is a uh, so-called window to the past. So maybe you're familiar with this specific um, photographer, uh, Kenny Zoltanet, he's from Hungary, but there's a lot of this kind of window to the past, then and now um, kind of um, photographers. And in some way also like what Alex said, did is uh, it's this kind of combination of like, you know, um, information, real information, photogrammetry, and then layered on top. And um, that's what colleagues, so these are all recent works. Um, our work is from, from June this year. This is um, from uh, our colleagues at BBC R&D. So that's from April. And uh, they have an interesting um, project that I want to show you. Um, funnily enough, it's not so much about the content. So it's a research project on 5G networks and the content delivery. But what they do is, um, hold on. Um, so I have to <coughs> briefly switch, or maybe uh, I'll just increase the volume here. Let me see. It won't be on the mic, it's fine. Um, so we are here. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> okay, that should. So yeah, we're here today to test out the Roman Bass 5G application that we've made that kind of gives you a window back in time. Uh, this uses a 3D model that's been exported to 360 video. This then allows us to align that 360 video to the physical environment here at the Roman Bath and then give you this window back into how the Roman Bath would have looked at different points in time. But we think the concept of providing a, a window back in time that relies on a really high bandwidth video or you know, excellent quality animations could have applications in education and entertainment for all kinds of historical places, you know, possibly complementing BBC programmes or providing information and guidance in, in museums and other kinds of, of locations like that. We came upon the idea of looking at these three different points in time. The Celtic period, when the Roman Bath Thermal Spring was first discovered, then into the Roman period, when the um, bath started to fall into disrepair and the roof collapsed, uh, and then into the Victorian period, when uh, this upper terrace that we're now stood on was uh, built. So this is an Android application that uses AR Core to perform the image alignment. So this aligns the 360 video to the physical environment. And then we then go into a 360 video player which streams from a remote server at the University of Bristol the 360 video, uh, which is then displayed to the user. And then on top of this 360 video, there is some informational hotspots. All right, so... Um Okay, now um, this is an interesting project because it shows like when you have um, great graphics artists, uh, what you can do with existing technology. So this is actually technically not all too complicated. So you have a marker based solution. You saw this kind of coins with this kind of code around, you just pass on, it's recognized and then it starts this 360 video full overlay. Um, and it, it uses position only. So basically it's just related to this marker. You just move your phone and then it, it appears like you're around here. Um, for us, I mean, because we're also particularly interested in mobile AR, so using um, everyday devices for, for doing AR, um, we think that th this is slightly limited in terms of interaction. It's a great experience, um, but this is what you can do now, and, but we want to go beyond that and see uh, what's happening there. And so, um, hold on, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the second example, and this is just a, a, a kind of, if you like, a stock image to, to get you into the mind frame, because again, we do mobile VR, uh, we don't use the uh, headset. We are interested in interactive and collaborative mixed reality. So that is a group of people that interact uh, with the same digital objects, virtual objects, okay? And uh, we don't want to use any kind of dedicated hardware, but standard mobile technologies which complicates things, but things are also moving in the right direction, okay? So uh, just to give you the, the background of this in terms of context, so we have this project which is called uh, Colatrex, which stands for Collaborative Context Aware Training and Exploration, and again, we focus on the in-situ collaboration within groups of learners that engage in various educational scenarios, right? That could be layman groups, that could be of university students. And uh, just to visualize the collaborative abs uh, aspect of this, so this is the Opera House uh, and Ballet um, place here in, in Lviv. And imagine um, that you have 
uh, a couple of people on this place, right, that have all mobile devices and they are all interconnected. And basically they do something based on the context that they are in. And that context uh, can be essentially, we use absolute relative, um, absolute and relative spatial temporal context. So um, the standard, if you like, case that you have here would be like um, the location, right? So this is like you're at a specific point and you have access to some activity. Um, so that could be a point or an area of interest, um, but also relative is important. So if you think collaborative, like uh, the distance to different groups or different uh, players, users, uh, might be also determining whether you see an activity or have an access to an activity or not. Now, in terms of um, temporal um, context, it's obviously you can uh, provide certain activities at a specific point in time or in a specific period, but also here the relative um, context is important because, and now this is not history in a historic sense, but this means a more history in a kind of sequential sense. So you could provide uh, access to a specific activity only after you have completed a couple of milestones before. So this is like how you can uh, actually make activities um, an explorative experience through the city, right? So only after you did the first three ones, the fourth and fifth will be available to you, right? So this is sequential. Okay, and the last bit is this kind of mobile training exploration bit. So this is the activity types that are accessible to you then, right? And we have all sorts of different um, activity types um, that you see here. And these types can be combined. For instance, in this case, that would be field recording combined uh, with framing. We call it framing. So you have a landmark, could be a statue, whatever, a historical site. And now this is a group of four users. And they would like uh, kind of circle around this object and take um, pictures from different perspectives, which are then um, you know, put together. And then you can evaluate them both automatically or by, by some sort of teacher or instructor. Um, but we also do have uh, now mixed reality activities in here, okay? And these mixed reality um, activities, so basically this is the kind of map screen that we have. So you move around and this is very similar to what you know from Google Maps or so. You'll see these pins and you can select an activity there and then, you know, just go ahead um, what's, uh, and do what's available to you here. And I'm going to talk now about uh, what we actually imagine uh, this interaction to be. And this is going to get slightly technical, but it's also very graphical, so I hope um, it you will be fine with this. So um, let's take a simple example. So this is our old campus, right? And um, this is a, an augmented reality example. So we just have this floating cube that is um, overlaid onto reality, okay? So this is, I mean, you could argue if this is an augmentation, but it's there, okay? So, <laughs> <coughs> And the standard way of doing this nowadays would be on-screen interaction. Okay, so you have your mobile device and then you see something that's been overlaid by the, on the camera image and then you would do something here. So, not sure how many uh, of you are aware of or are even gamers, right? But uh, like Pokemon Go or so is played by millions of people. And basically, if there's some sort of thing here in this location, I would see a, a monster that I can, can pinch balls on doing that on the screen. Okay, um, and we think that this kind of touch-based input is really the conventional option and it's the reduced viewing space um, that hampers immersion. So this is not, not ideal, thank you. Not ideal, um, so on-screen interaction is really possible but not uh, what we want to. So we are thinking, okay, how about off-screen interaction? It wouldn't be much cooler to actually use your hand and do stuff. Um, and we do believe um, that it's at least also more flexible, right? So you have various uh, modes. It's a more intuitive way of doing things. So if you wanted to throw something, you would actually throw it instead of doing some gesture. There is more gestures and ultimately also higher immersion, right? Um, so that is, that is the goal. And um, a problem that you have both in augmented virtuality and reality is uh, so-called occlusion, which is in the nature of things. So you overlay a camera image with, a, uh, with an object, right? But then you have a flat camera in which you put something on top, but what you want is actually, you want your hand obviously to be like closer to you and the object behind your hand, right? So the depth information is a problem. Um, and the image recognition is really a, a tricky bit. And so what you want to end up with is 
exactly that image, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that could be any object of your choosing. It depends actually on the artist on how, how immersive that turns or not. I will skip the next slide because it's, that's a processing pipeline on how we recognize hands. <laughs> I'll just give you an idea on the process, okay? So basically what you start with is uh, with an image, okay? That's a standard camera image, okay? Um, that's in a red, green, blue color space, and then you process it, basically you turn it into uh, hue saturation value spaces. Um, then you get a binary image after you do filtering, thresholding, blurring, and then you do some erosion and dilation, right? So that you get the contours, and what you end up with is a convex hull and the defect points of the hand. So you, you detect um, by software processing the hand, right? Which is important to handle the occlusion, right? So that we can have the depth there. And now this is a, a demo, this is on a, on a phone. Uh, and it's, this has been done in real time. So um, if you look here, so this is detected, detecting the hand, like a student of mine doing this. And you see basically the convex hull and also like the important points that we need for detecting gestures. And the important thing is that this happens on a non-too high-powered phone locally, so there's no cloud service involved or, or whatsoever, okay? And then having this, you can start um, actually creating gestures of your choosing, right? And I'll just briefly give you two examples for um, two gestures. Uh, one is the more simple one. This is this point-move gesture with feature point. So technically, it would be like if you pointed something that would be the start of it, and then the, if you actually move it down, that would detect the gesture as a trigger. And we thought, okay, let's get a demo for this. Um, and a very simple 3D set would be a sliding puzzle. Mm -hmm. All right, and these sliding puzzles is basically, you can determine the size, so this is actual screenshot, so you can put any image on it and say, you know, I want 100 pieces, or I want 25 pieces, or so. So the university logo, for instance, is four by four, and then the treasure map there is five by five. And uh, you can also, I mean, have this kind of, if you think about um, kind of um, activities that really engage, you have this kind of level, am amount of mystery or so, we solve riddles or so, okay? And now this is a demo, including the, all the information that you saw that is detected. So um, the actual image is just your hand with you doing this. But now you see actually what the uh, phone is seeing here, all right? And so basically you can move the pieces by doing this, this gesture. And again, um, the hand is cut like here occluded because it's actually bound to this uh, convex hull. But if we would uh, take out this visualization, it would be just you moving the, a puzzle that is laying uh, correctly on a table or any surface that you can detect. All right. Um, <coughs> another kind of um, intuitive gesture would be a grab gesture, and that is you just you know grab something. You see it, you grab it. It's a kind of um, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you start the moment that you that you are on Earth, you start doing that. <laughs> and uh, so this is you need a couple of more defect points for this. And we thought, okay, what would be a nice, nice object, like a 3D object to try this on? And for this, we take as an example the, the Jenga tower, right? Which is a game that all of you know, right? So uh, this tower, you place, you take out pieces, you put on top, and the first one who makes the, the tower collapse loses, okay? And, and so this is an actual screenshot, so um, with uh, different colored um, blocks there, the stable and the collapsing tower. And now also a small um, video of that in action. And again, it's with the occlusion information. So basically you would, the, the red brick is the one that you kind of mark. So that's the selected one as a visualization. And this is like pulling it, okay? Um, so this is an early prototype. So it's mostly um, for testing the gesture. Obviously you could, uh, you could make it kind of uh, closer to the hand in a way that it feels really like grabbing it. But you will, unless you get mixed media, you will really never feel that you have the, the block in your hand. But also there, there's uh, technologies that work, for instance, with air pressure that make you feel like you're gripping something. So let's say there's um, uh, a piano that is, you play it mid-air, but it feels exactly like a real piano. So people are working on this. Okay, but it's essentially like a, an air organ that gives you the, the, the stuff there. All right, and um, so this is what we're looking at. Um, and uh, just to sum up, 
uh, if you like. Um, we do believe that mixed reality has a huge potential, um, not just in, in representing like historical information, but in general, because it can provide rich experiences that really go beyond just providing practical information like the navigation, like go here or there, right? So you can convey um, any type of, of kind of background and, and actually uh, narrative that you choose to, right? Because it's a very engaging way of um, also like, obviously you have to be at that specific spot. Uh, but you can do this also indoors, uh, which is a more controlled environment. And you, you control, it's a kind of a really interactive way of, of storytelling. And, um, but there are obviously technical limitations to this. And that's basically, um, I feel, why I'm here. So the pitfalls um, are, and that's why I showed you these examples, are um, that basically um, accurate positioning. So um, like in the first example, you had uh, the, those markers, right? And doing accurate positioning and overlaying beyond marker-based or beacon-based um, technology is still tricky. So. If, you, if we went out to the street here and we would love to just use our phone and overlay the real buildings with a representation of that building a hundred of years ago, or let's say we took that from pictures, like a bit like a window of a car, that is a real problem because the positioning is not as accurate. So first your location, uh, I mean, civil GPS is not fine enough. Um, so you can't really rely being on that specific position and with that orientation and then overlay it. So you need lots of image recognition and people are also working on this, but it's a kind of trained neural networks that will help you map this exactly. Because if we speak photorealistic AR, it means essentially that if there's even a slight disturbance or offset, all the immersion is gone, right? So the more realistic it is, the, the more you detect it as a user, right? So even location is a pr problem. Now, speaking about indoor versus outdoor, uh, so indoor is a controlled environment. Maybe you, you uh, remember that the BBC um, example was at night. That is obviously ideal because, um, you know, you have really controlled conditions there. The truth is that um, if you're outside, even small changes in lighting conditions can make you have severe problems in detecting the hand even <coughs> or uh, other, other kind of features. Okay, um, so this susceptibility to, to this kind of small atmospheric changes is unfortunately a reality, but also here people are working at it, and it's, uh, it's getting better. Um, and then this so-called engineer's bias is something that's really important. Um, so most of these technologies have been developed by white Caucasian males, um, <laughs> testing, it, <laughs> testing it on white Caucasian males. <laughs> so, um, in a different context, you've maybe heard about the, the mishap that Google had with the neural network and photo recognition and classification. That's exactly the point. I mean, even just a slightly darker skin tone might hamper the, the recognition a lot. The good news here is though that also this is, uh, will be under control soon because we move from image processing to having infrared cameras and other hardware that is reliably detecting live people. So. It's discriminating vampires, but nothing else, okay? <laughs> um, and there's lots of other kind of technicalities of this, but it's still um, huge potential. And it's, um, again, we see it not from the commercial side, obviously everybody has this huge frenzy about AR and VR as well. Um, but I truly believe that this is uh, the, the next game-changing technology. Um, like we had like the internet, then smartphones, like mobile computing of that sort and then augmented reality will essentially become um, a reality. We use smartphones simply because they, everybody has it now. And if I look around, everybody has a pretty neat smartphone uh, around. So that's what we use it for. But there will be um, headsets or um, glasses that barely you wouldn't see the difference between normal glasses. And retinal projection will be, for instance, much better and higher resolution. Um, so beyond the kind of Google um, Glass uh, attempt that they had once, um, this will become much more proliferative. And so also like to wrap up again for, for history, it, I mean, imagine you walk around and you, you get this kind of really interactive overlaid experiences, um, hopefully very well curated by historians and very well designed by graphic designers. 
uh, but it will give you this totally different dimension. Okay, and uh, basically that will be my talk. So uh, well, questions and ideas are, are more than welcome after the session. So this is the, the form here. And you're also uh, welcome to, to check out our, our website because this is uh, only some of the things that we do in the lab. Okay. okay. Thank you, Jean. Uh, we are heading towards our third presentation. Now, Sana will help to connect our next presenters, and I have uh, a few seconds to announce them. Uh, so, we have uh, Johan Hulevich. Uh, Johan, he is uh, actually a philologist and a researcher, a rather philosopher, not a technical person. And then, Roman Huck is a photographer and media artist. And recently, they, together with other people, some of them sitting here, uh, they and, uh, uh, endeavored to make a virtual reconstruction of uh, uh, specific objects in the city of Lviv. And the title of their presentation is Reenactive Artistic Heritage via Augmented Reality. And please use your headphones because the presentation will be in Ukrainian language. Uh, so, uh, Це відео зняти в музеї Пензеля, який є філією картинної галереї, де ми реалізовуємо великий проект по оцифруванню спадщини барокового скульптора Пензеля. В презентації ми будемо показувати скульптури Пензеля, також будемо показувати інший проект, який реалізовується в нацмузеї Львівському, де ми оцифровуємо барокового Написця Йова Канделевича, його спадщину. Тобто, 
ці процеси, які зараз є на екрані, це все така собі підготовка, побудова цієї конструкції, створення середовища для розсіяного рівномірного світла, для того, щоб отримати якісний, придатний для роботи 3D-скан. Ми використовуємо фотограметрію та лазерне сканування, яке потім поєднуємо це за допомогою програмного забезпечення. І далі вже з цим матеріалом працюємо як для VR, так і для AR, і для 3D-друку. Зараз я перемкнуся на презентацію далі. Ми обрали для себе, для прикладу, якихось таких дві ключові дві точки. Тобто, в нас є модель 360, тобто скульптура, і в нас є рельєфи, які ви побачите на наступних слайдах. Тобто, для однієї скульптури у нас в середньому виходить півтори-три тисячі фотографій, які займають там до 300 гігабайт інформації. Це все робиться для того, щоб у нас відбулося в програмному забезпеченні, яке це все збирає, є поняття, яке називається триангуляція. Тобто ця вся модель, от будь-яка скульптура, яка зображена зараз на цих чотирьох файлах, тобто це є по факту координати X, Y, Z які складаються з мільярда точок, які формують нам якби цей віртуальний об'єм. Ці всі крапочки білі навколо скульптур – це є фотографії, які робляться за певним там алгоритмом на певних відстанях і рівнях. Тут можна побачити такий уже якби плюс-мінус кінцевий результат, що ми отримуємо на кінці з такого масиву Даних, тобто ми отримуємо надточну 3D-модель, це є дерев'яна скульптура, це є об'єм, на який натягнута текстура, де можна бачити абсолютно якби, всі-всі пошкодження, всі дефекти, це є виробова скульптура з 17 століття. Тобто потім цей матеріал в майбутньому буде використовуватися для реставраторів, для дослідників. Тут можна все-все докладно роздивитися на місці. Ось ще один приклад, Ангел Пусто. Друга модель, от, тобто на противагу скульптурі 360, це є іконостас, його висота 13 метрів, ширина 11 метрів. Це для нас був такий своєрідний войклик. Ми працювали тільки над збором матеріалу 350 годин то в е, нас є там порядка 30 тисяч фотографій і близько там 300 станцій е, 3D-сканерів. Е, ми зібрали ось отаку кімнату в 3D, е, після чого всі ці частини окремо ще опрацьовувалися з додаванням там більшої кількості фото, бо нас не влаштовувала деталізація. Це найбільший об'єкт наразі, най, найякісніший, найбільший об'єкт у нас музей, який ми робили. Тут використовується порядка 5 тисяч фотографій, плюс 3D-сканер. Оця зверху скріншот з програми, де він зеленого кольору. Це якби перший скан, який має 2 мільярди полігонів. Тобто модель з кількістю таких полігонів наразі, ну, не може відкрити там жодна машина, ми повинні її спрощувати, тобто ми отримуємо гіпервисоку якість, яка потім ще на майбутнє можна буде до неї неодноразово повертатися. Ось це якби вже результат цієї, ну, обчислення цієї програми. Тут ми бачимо частини цього іконостасу, бачимо цю всю різьбу. Це є текстура, та без текстури сам наш об'єм. Тут на 
цьому скріншоті, навіть не знаю, чи видно на екрані, ми отримуємо навіть об'єм ось де, ось тут. Тут видно, якщо там більше призумати на самій моделі, то ми можемо навіть побачити об'єм від мазка пензлика, побачити всі рельєфи лебкасу, тобто це гіперточна копія у нас виходить. Але ми з нею якби, не можемо працювати, бо її там, ні ми, ні там, люди не можуть використовувати, вона гіперважка. Тому ми змушені спрощувати і адаптовувати це все якби, під різноманітні потреби. І тут вже якби, вступає людський фактор, якщо попередньо там, програма 5 днів обчислювала цю модель, ми чекали, поки там машина це обрахує. Тобто тут відбувається чистка цієї моделі, відбувається там мінімальний скульптинг, відбувається ретопологія. Тобто на цій моделі ми бачимо трикутнички. Це якби такий от цей приклад цієї трангуляції. Це є модель складена з трикутників. Нам треба зробити, щоб вона складалася з квадратиків. Це її полегшує. Це потім нам дає змогу працювати з нею в доданій та віртуальній реальності. Ось. Це все, що було на рахунок сканування, але якби, ми зразу розуміли, що для оцифрування музейних колекцій цього є мало, і нам треба якби, працювати в інших напрямках, тому ми використовуємо комплексний підхід, ми розробляємо під кожний проект веб-ресурси. Ми робимо веб-ресурси, там, як в нас виходить, там, на 4-5 мовах, залежить від е, самої теми. Е, саме на цьому сайті, Pinzel.ar, у е, нас є 3D-галерея скульптур, які ми оцифровуємо. Скульптур є дуже багато, вони розкидані по Україні, по Німеччині, тобто ми все ще в процесі оцифрування цього всього. Наразі ми охопили тільки Львів. На веб-ресурсі ми зібрали повністю всю бібліографію, що стосується цього майстра цієї доби цих скульптур. Зібрали якби, відносно цієї бібліографії наших досліджень сканів, наші історики, реставратори понакосували дослідження, які можна почитати на цьому ресурсі. Також якби, ми частково зіткнулися з, з, певним, з певною проблемою, що молодь е, сучасна не дуже вникає в ці тексти, ми змушені були зробити відеолекторії. Е, і це все так само інтегровано в наші мобільні аплікації, е, які е, мають аудіогід в собі. Це все використовується зараз туристами, тобто це є пророблені маршрути там, від музею до музею, які розповідають про майстра Пінзеля, розповідають про скульптури. Ну, тобто, і в цій аплікації так само можна відкрити структуру в 3D, послухати про неї і покрутити. Тобто, тобто там є в нас і VR, і AR. Це працює. Це, якби, зараз частинка про 3D-друк. Я попрошу Софію видати. Тобто так само ми зрозуміли, що тактильний досвід в музеї є дуже важливий не тільки для там, незрячих і слабозрячих людей, але й для людей, які бачать, тому що очима не завжди можна зрозуміти і збагнути якби, цю всю форму, цю всю текстуру і так далі. І ми... Це прототипи якби, зменшені копії, ми зараз будемо доповнювати постійну експозицію музею більшими копіями цих скульптур, для того, щоб до них можна було доторкнутися і відчути на дотик і покрутити, бо скульптури насправді великі, вони там від півтора до трьох метрів, вони там експозиції.
сумуються, якби не зовсім зручно, тобто не, ми не можемо навколо них обійти, подивитися зі всіх сторін, тут можна їх покрутити, тут все відчути. Ось. Так само ми зіткнулися ще з одною проблемою під час сканування, тобто в нас є скульптура 360 об'ємна, як би тут все зрозуміло, в нас є рельєфи, як були на іконостасі, тут теж все простіше, але в нас є вежевопис, який плоский. І нам треба було його якимось чином як би, так само передати для людей, які є незрячі чи слабозрячі. Ось один з прикладів останніх, які ми робили, це є відсканована дошка, на якій намальована ікона. Ми перевели її як би, в об'єм, перевели плоске зображення, тобто сам живопис, і так само вона повністю буде в масштабі друкуватися на 3D принтері і буде інтегрована в постійну експозицію на нас музею. Зараз трошки розповім про те, як ми вибираємо артефакти, з якими працюємо і чому саме так. В наших архівах є матеріали, от, наприклад, як оцей, це капуця Боїнів, це, можна так сказати, випадкове сканування, тобто це коли ми ще вчилися, коли у нас ще якби, не, у нас не було доступу до музейних колекцій, тобто ми живемо в чудовому місці, де є багато об'єктів, які цікаво сканувати. Ось один з них, тобто він у нас в архіві, він ніде не використовувався, але він нами був вибраний для сканування. Це ще один такий самий об'єкт, але це вже більша площа. І тут цікаво, що от коли ми скануємо велику архітектурну форму, в даному прикладі це є львівський органний зал, ми охоплюємо все, що є навколо нього. Тобто в нашому архіві так само якби, опиняються інакші об'єкти, інакші там, архітектурні споруди, які ми не планували сканувати, але так чи інакше вони у нас є відскановані, зберігаються у нас на цьому, на сервері. Скульптурна пластика в місті, її дуже багато. Це також скульптура Пінзеля на церкві Юра. Також ми маємо таку ситуацію в нас в країні, що в нас тисячі закинутих різних об'єктів, сакральних і не тільки, тобто різних років. Вони не консервуються, не реставруються. Тобто, якщо виїхати за межі Львова, то практично в кожному селі буде якийсь такий цікавий об'єкт. Ми, коли дозволяє погода, їздимо і це все стануємо, а погода нам потрібна не сонячна і не дощова, нам потрібна хмарна, щоб у нас було допутне розсіяне м'яке світло для того, щоб ми отримали якби, якісний стан. Ось це є всі ці об'єкти, їх є насправді тисячі, але з кожним роком їх стає все менше і менше, бо з ними ніхто не працює, вони просто занепадають. Тобто ми собі взяли за пріоритет збирати колекцію якихось таких об'єктів. Це треба робити скан як і екстер'єрів, так і інтер'єрів Ось на цьому фото. Це от один теж з прикладів випадкових, це ми теж як тільки вчились, це не дуже там, гіперякісний стан, але тим не менше він у нас є, це було зроблено десь 4 роки тому, і саме в цьому об'єкті вже попадало багато склепінь, як там повідвалювалася ліпнина, тобто він у нас є збережений в кращому стані, ніж він зараз фізично перебуває. Всім цим багажом, звичайно, що ми вели перемовини з музеями, і в нас пріоритеті зараз оцифрування фондових сховищ. Тобто це є об'єкти, які не експонуються в галереях, музеях, це є об'єкти, до яких доступ закритий. Тобто їх ніхто не бачить, туди попасти неможливо. Ми зараз працюємо 
виховання в там певних фондів і будемо це все заставляти на веб-ресурсах для загального доступу. Також ми досліджуємо старі архівні матеріали, тобто цих об'єктів, які ми скануємо. Перша фотографія – це є скульптура Святої Анни, це є Пінзель. Зараз покажу, як крутиться. То це зараз так виглядає її стан, ми можемо бачити, що тут вже в неї немає руки. Тобто в неї там спалена часткова голова. Ось на цій фотографії ще є збережені елементи, які ми зараз будемо пробувати відновити відносно старих фотографій у віртуальній та доданій реальності на оцей існуючий скан вже. Так само в нас є такий своєрідний виклик, це є храм, який знаходиться в селі Годовиця, скульптор Пінзель, скульптура, якого я перед цим показував, робив для цього храму вівтар. Вівтар зараз знаходиться, сам храм знаходиться в такому стані. Історично так склалося, що скульптури збереглися, вони зараз вже набули статусу музейних експонатів, вони вже не є там храмовими, сакральними скульптурами, тобто це вже є чіткі музейні експонати, які експонуються зовсім не так, як задумував автор. Тут можна побачити, як було і як стало, тобто це зараз наші дні. Це от скульптури, які зараз є на експозиції в музеї, які, з якими ми працюємо, ми їх відсканували. Ми зараз хочемо за допомогою VR і AR інтегрувати ці скульптури у відсканований оцей закинутий хмар, храм і в там, старих креслень зробити якусь схематичну реконструкцію і поставити їх на свої міста і зробити в музеї таку віар-атракцію для відвідувачів. Ось це є одна з культур з цього храму. Та сама ситуація є в місті Бучерськ. Це Тернопільська область, так само це є архітектурна споруда, де були скульптури цього майстра. Тут цікава ситуація, що ці скульптури зараз зберігаються в чотирьох різних містах і в двох областях України. І ми по камінчиках їх збираємо, скануємо і у VR хочемо якби, зібрати цю ясну картину. Ну, от такі виклики перед нами, тобто я передаю слово Сону і Євгену. Так, Богдан продовжує платися 10 хвилин, тому е, я, можливо, зачитаю, це буде швидше. Е, це Робко показав, як ми е, працюємо з цими матеріалами. Ну, я трошки скажу, як ми це також обговорюємо, принаймні, як воно у нас в голові осмислюється. Тому це так. Ну, от основна дія, власне, яка і, власне, нашу діяльність позначає, і загалом всю, можна і назвати скануванням. У українській мові сканування, це слово, воно зовсім недавнє, і має чітку прив'язку до технологій, але якщо брати всі його значення, з якими воно прийшло до нас, тобто менш видимо на значення, Воно, в принципі, є достатньо доброю аналогією того, що ми робимо, бо що нам не треться. Тобто, технологічне це сканування полягає в тому, що за допомогою світла ми ніби беремо одну, якусь одну поверхню і відображаємо на чомусь іншому. Але, власне, смисловий образ, який стоїть за цим, це якось ретельно, послідовно оглянути щось і щось знайти, власне, в цьому огляді. Що знайти означає перечепитися через це увагою, а звідси сканування етимологічно спорівнено з тим грецьким словом скандалон, до своєму камінь, через який спотикаєшся, через який перечіпаєшся. Сенс ретельності, послідовності звідси в цьому поняті скану, сканування постає з середньовічного латинського, латинського слова скан, 
воно пов'язано з відбуванням власне, ритму, поетичного ритму. Так? Тобто воно було царене такого речі філологічного. І повернусь словом скандувати, зокрема, це первісно читати вірші, чітко виділяючи наголошені склади в кожній стопі. Сенс швидкості, власне, додався до сканування в 20-х роках 20-го століття, коли винайшли перші пристрої, які прискорили цей процес. І тоді ж саме ренесансне слово «сканер» перестало позначати людину, яка практично щось вивчає, і стало позначати суботехнику. Отже, наше сканування, як видно з презентації, є комплексним процесом, який виростає з одного боку потреби щось зробити з спадщиною, через яку, власне, на яку ми власне, трапляємо своїм оком, а з другого з потреби зробити це якось технологічно. Тобто це, тут йдеться нам про якийсь такий баланс цих двох потреб. Що це також означає, що ми не маємо бути надміру залучені, занурені тільки в технологію, а ми мусимо бути десь рівнорядно, рівномірно залучені, ну, занурені також у спадщину. Тобто цікавитись так само цим. Відповідно, щоб сканування відбулося, воно має для нас бути комплексним, як ми його вважаємо, що воно буде успішним, і е, часоємним. Тобто, е, Ромко розказував про багато різних діяльностей, з яких воно складається, але кожен з цих діяльностей є, має свій досить великий час. Втім, основна річ у цьому, цьому процесі, родова чи онкологічна дія, це, власне, момент пересотворення оригіналу, може це так називати, пересотворення оригіналу. Щоб це сталося, технологія мусить, власне, зачепитися за цю діяльність, тобто вона має знайти якусь таку, дійти до матеріальної основи самого цього артефакту. Звідси потрібно стільки багато фотографій, стільки багато, власне, це, власне, оця така рутинна, дуже велика діяльність, яка, можливо, в майбутньому буде більш машини автоматизована. В принципі, вона і породжує оцей основну таку дії, яка робить для нас оцей унікальний об'єкт пересотворення. Тобто, це пересотворення також, як Ромко розказував, воно, що означає? Артефакт ми ніби вилучуємо з контекстів його, власне, з історичних контекстів, і ставимо в дуже такі нейтральні умови. Це на прикладі світла, зрозуміло. Тобто, Мають зникнути всі тіні, які додаються, тобто всі ці контекстуальні тіні, власні тіні також, і тому має бути це розсіяне рівномірно залите світло. Це дозволить перенести, власне, це в віртуальну діяльність. Ну і також, відповідно, дуже важливим чинником є це емоційно-фізичне наше залучення, тобто необхідне на якісне сканування. Це пов'язано з такими технологічними діями, як продумати, що ти робиш, проаналізувати, продумати цю послідовність дій, слідкувати за якістю фото, за налаштуванням на техніки. Це дуже часоємна робота, яка включає дуже великий людський фактор і, відповідно, один маленький провтик на цьому початку, він тягне за собою дуже великі проблеми при обробці і постобробці. Пересотворений артефакт ми надалі трактуємо як таку собі особливу копію оригіналу. Тут особливість в чому сенсі полягає. Тобто, з одного боку, тут є унікальний відбиток при народженні, тобто, бо різні люди по-різному сканують один той самий об'єкт. Сканування скільки часу триває, це може тривати по ночах там, 3, 4, 5 годин з перервами, тому це втомливий такий процес достатньо. Є важливим дуже людський цей фактор при постобробці, бо від постобробці залежить, власне, цей тривомірний друк віртуально та дозвіл на гральності. І є ще така важлива штука, як м'який вплив, який закладений закладує в самих алгоритмах обчислення цих тривомірних моделей, які теж писали певні люди з певними якимось уявленнями та ідеями. А це з одного боку. З іншого боку, що відбувається з самим об'єктом, який скан фіксує, ну ніби так, фіксує у вічності, так, такий цифрові вічності, вихопний і по-своєму дуже випадковий, це такий рандомний момент фізичного стану оригіналу. Бо оригінал має якісь свої тріщинки, він живе, він вмирає, там можуть жити терміти, які його гризуть, і відповідно те, що ми 
схоплюємо, це такий дуже, дуже гіперреалістичний, але якийсь дуже випадковий момент цього об'єкта, його життя, тобто його, чи це є історія. Своє особливістю для нас, як ми вважаємо, це те, що цей скан, який ми робимо, врешті-решт, він дозволяє нам також наближати оці наративи, які сам породжує сам по собі об'єкт, як та чи інша скульптура Кінзеля, ближче до оригіналу, ніби, бо це, це пов'язано, власне, з доступом і з можливостями ці наративи попередні якось зробити ближчими до, до самого оригіналу, чи через сайт, чи через аплікацію, чи через, не знаю, це дивитися. Отже, ми вибираємо достатньо великі об'єкти для сканування. Вони достатньо мають бути складні, бо це є наш можливо, такий, важливий для нас момент, що вони мають бути технологічним викликом достатньо. І, ви, і як правило, вони мало доступні. Про доступність ще коротко скажу. Як ми тут чули, технологічні можливості весь час зростають. Тобто поступ збільшується і е, можна сказати, що технологію, ну, може так узагальнити, що технологія вона належить в якомусь образу майбутнього, а ми працюємо про цьому зі спадщиною, з якимось образом, ну, таким первинним, гемонним образом минулого. Відповідно, ці дві цари недіяльності, їх можна так розділити, технології спадщини, умовно, вони достатньо взаємосуперечливі. І е, намагаються включити в орбіту свого, власне, свого дискурсу, власне, свою роду подмолатнику, оцей спадщина технологія, технологія спадщина. Наприклад, з умовної позиції спадщини технологія є заручником ринковості, серійного відтворення, несправності, справжні речі, е, за словами Беніміна, це, власне, сукупність усього, що передається в ній від походження, починаючи від матеріального створення, матеріального існування і до того, як вона функціонує як свідок історичних якихось, як історичний свідок. Так? І так само, наприклад, з позиції умовної спадщини гине в добу технічної відтворності мистецького твору, як власне називається ця стаття, це, це розвідка Беніміна, гине аура твору. Щось таке малохопне історичне і не історичне, як сказати, неуманне. І е, е, зникає також особистий контакт до твору. Тобто, ніби спадщина нам каже, що технологія робить якісь, дуже щось погане з цим твором. А за умовною позицією технології, власне, з якою ми спробуємо стояти спадщина, замкнена у дуже статичних культових формах, вона недоекспонована, вона недоартикульована як мистецтво, вона навіть недополітизована, а цінність і потенціал мистецького твору формує не так сам твір, як місце і інституційний антураж. Тобто глядач більше контактує з дискурсом, ніж з самим твором, зокрема приходячи в музей. Там, де спадщина каже зберігати шанобливу дистанцію до твору на благо цілісного індивідуального сприйняття, технологія пропонує цю дистанцію скасувати до твору, враховуючи оцей такий масове колективне сприйняття. Це відбувається своєрідна така боротьба за дистанцію. Ми обрали для сканування мистецьких творів передусім культового призначення, ну, сакрального призначення. Ці твори вже були колись вибрані, винесені в місце сакрального функціонування в музейній колекції, які, власне, які інституалізували культурну спадщину, зробили з культурну спадщину. З культури Кінзеля, Панаста Станзелевича, навіть посмертна маска Тараса Шевченка, яку ми теж сканували, перестала бути органічною частиною ритуалу посвящення і стала таким сакралізуючим моментом музеїфікованої спадщини. Скажімо, творчість Кінзеля, включення якої в систему спадщини, Власне, що їх є кілька таких систем спадщини. Е, ну, на прикладі Кінзеля, наприклад, було підготовлено польськими та українськими науковцями в першій половині ХХ століття. Генезис на ця система перша виростає з інвентаризаційних переписів, е, власне, тих перших тогочасних сканувальних практик, тих майнових скарбів, пам'ятник архітектури і мистецтва, що їх почало проводити наприкінці 19 століття польських громадконсерваторів. Але чини, за прикладом, 
правовими практиками і циркулярами імперської Віденської центральної комісії злочиня збереження мистецьких історичних пам'ятків. Я це так довго цитую, і це воно так вже саме по собі створює такий антураж важливості. Ну і що я, власне, робить якась не зробиться. А в 60-х, 70-х роках 20-го століття в культурі Кінделя починає відшуковувати, збирати, осмислювати як більшу якусь уявлену цілість, як сконструювану колекцію Борис Возницький, який у 1996-му відкриває у Львові музей Кінделя. Ця пошукова досліна вніяльність додає до творчості Кінделя такий особливий для нашого сприйняття спадщини мотив врятування, аспект врятованості. Ця думка дискурсивна, вона так, наприклад, висловлюється на сайті Львівської галереї картини, де особливою сторінкою в долі музею 1960-70-х років була експозиційна робота, в результаті якої врятовано понад 12 тисяч творів. Ну і в наш час, відповідно до цих музейних нових практик, ставиться новий виклик, нові вимоги, наприклад, вимога новизни і інноваційності, яку цілком певним чином Український культурний фонд, який підтримує також нашу роботу, така проєктна діяльність, він ставить якісь такі дивні вимоги, на які ти вже мусиш крутити собі в голові, і так чи інакше вони впливають. Що таке є на визнавцьому випадку? Тобто і це необхідність нового часу, він тобі каже, треба бути інтерактивним зі своїм глядачем, будь до нього уважним. Отже, наша технологія відкрита до цих систем попередніх. Ми вже обтяжені певними свідченнями цього історичного процесу. Тобто ми враховуємо інвентаризаційний систем, пневматизуючий ніби аспект, і рятувальний, і зберігальний, і інтерактивний. В тій чи іншій мірі ми намагаємося включити в його ніби оцей комплекс для мислення, оцей створення конкретної віртуальної моделі чи віртуальної галереї. І, власне, працюючи над цим комплексом, щодо Кінзеля, ми неминуче виявляємо як міру недодослідженості його творів, недоврятованості його скульптур і, власне, недоекспонованості. Тобто, це ніби добре все, але це і не буде зовсім не добре. Ще коротко про доступ. Доступ, власне, буває теж різний, тобто ми теж працюємо ніби з такою ідеєю цього доступу. Доступитися до верхніх рядів Богоречанського іконостасу на висоті 11 метрів дуже важко, бо важко побачити деталі, треба наблизитися до того фізично. Відповідно, це один вид доступу. Є вид доступу, наприклад, який дозволяє доступати інвалідів, людям з обмеженими можливостями навіть до сайту та інклюзивний дизайн. Тобто над доступом треба працювати, тобто це така діяльність. І завершую це все, значить, екзерсис цей. Масове сприйняття вже сталося, воно вже постійно нависає над аурою твору. Тут питання, наше питання, наш такий тонкий виклик, це зрозуміти, які в цьому контексті нові можливості індивідуального доступу. Одною з відповідей, власне, є звертання до тактильного досвіду, до того ж, як його своїм певним, дуже своєрідним чином дає оця віртуальна чи доповнена реальність. Ми не можемо доторкатися твору, тому що масовий досвід нищить цей твір, нищить відстань, але маніпулюючи в хорошому сенсі, оцею віртуальною копією твору, чи пальпуючи його, власне, цю тривимірну копію, ми додаємо до цього оптичного, ніби новий тілесний досвід, який дозволяє призвичаюватись до творів по-новому, по-іншому, тобто додає зовсім інший новий тілесний досвід. Мистецький твір дає нам медитативність споглядання і потік наших власних асоціацій, момент власного зосередження, а скан-модель, власне, критичність цього спостереження, тобто доповнений критичний потік асоціацій, власне, цей тактильний досвід, який залишає в дії певний простір центрального. Тобто ми ніби працюємо з намаганням знайти якийсь новий баланс і новий діалог. I think it's a good conclusion for this session. We started from the issues of truth, then the virtual or digital touch, and then to the, the issue of uh, fight for distance and the possibility of having this digital touch. And I invite Taras to 
have some reflections. Yeah, thank you, Bogdan. Thank you, all the participants. It actually was very fascinating to, to have these all insights about virtual reality, augmented reality as a, te as a technology. For me, as a person who intentionally got rid of its smartphone, his smartphone, and I, I, I'm as a person who doesn't use uh, a smartphone at all, it's very interesting to have this insta uh, those insights, and it's really interesting uh, to have this distance to, to the technology and to the uh, to the to those insights because virtual reality as a thing for me I mean it's always interesting uh, whether virtual reality is um, mm, uh, oh, oh by the way thank you for this notion about uh, uh, diminished reality as well and this notion <laughs> about headphones because uh, actually it made me thinking whether virtual reality is something that uh, we have only with this technology or we call, can also call um, I don't know, maybe an image motion picture film from the beginning of the century virtual and reality as well. What makes a film from the beginning of 20th century less virtual or less reality than, uh, than technology that we use today? And this is the more general question. Uh, maybe you would have, uh, it's even not, not a question, but rather a comment. So if you have uh, some, uh, I don't know, uh, some, some things uh, about uh, about this, uh, it's rather general to everyone, but I also have some specific questions to each of the presentation. First one is to uh, Alexei about his project and his, uh, uh, his narrative about uh, deconstructing Russian propaganda myths. Uh, actually, it's a question about accessibility and access, inclusion, because um, well, I was uh, also, uh, all those examples and case studies that you mentioned during the presentation about Russia propaganda uh, during Maidan and the annexation of Crimea and Russia uh, and the war on, on, on Donbass, it's actually, uh, I was involved in covering all those uh, myths, fakes and disinformation uh, situation and I was trying also to fact check all this information and cover uh, somehow demystify or debunk all those uh, uh, fake news. So I was also very uh, involved in this process. And uh, for me, my, I don't know, one of conclusions of, uh, of, the, of my experience was uh, in the fact that we actually have this rather reactional attitude to this information than um, proactional. It's not proactive attitude, it's rather reactive. And uh, I think, and we had the, this discussion about uh, propaganda and messages that are disseminated by propaganda yesterday with the posters. And I think that uh, the real essence and the real mm, purpose of propaganda and uh, all those fake, fake news is about uh, uh, not about uh, constructing very specific, thorough, mm, I don't know, fakes that are uh, somehow should. Uh, I don't know, misinform us. It's rather to mix everything up, to make uh, uh, navigation through the informational space very difficult. And it's in the, the reason for this is to make it really quick, really, uh, uh, really um, disseminated and penetrated as much as possible. That's why poster works better than uh, anything else. You don't need to, I mean, poster is a medium, you can have it everywhere and the small any kind of picture can have it everywhere. You can disseminate it through different uh, medias into very various groups, and then you can basically have a, a really, really simple, really short, uh, penetrating message that uh, does not necessarily has to be a fact or uh, true. But its message, uh, the, the purpose for this message is not about true; is for uh, like mixing everything up, messing everything up. So my question would be whether the VR technology uh, as it is, uh, in terms of access, makes it possible to deconstruct those myths if, if, they are, uh, if they are working at the very moment when they disseminated. So back in 2014, they were made for, for the very moment in uh, February 2014, for example, and they're not that relevant today, uh, five years afterwards, because they were not uh, done for, uh, for living a long time. They were done for a really simple, really short period of time. And, uh, and they were very accessible in terms of uh, media dissemination through uh, different kinds of media. And virtual reality technology is not that accessible as, for example, television, I don't know, even those uh, social media networks or even posters, uh, let's say. Uh, so, uh, by deconstructing this specific myth, uh, how it is, uh, how, I mean, what is your attitude to the accessibility of this project to general public, or if it's 
not the case for you, or if it's not the purpose for this project to make it accessible for everyone, would it be accessible for everyone? How, how would you see your, I don't know, audience uh, that would uh, somehow have this experience of exploring this documentary VR project? Uh, so this was the first question. The second one is rather related to uh, temporality. If it was about access, the second one, uh, thank you Jean for your presentation, for those technical insights into this technology, it was very useful. And uh, for me, uh, the question of temporality is quite interesting in this case, because, I mean, temporality of technology, let's say, of medium. because. Um, uh, if you take a book, for example, if you take a book as a medium and uh, that uh, used to, uh, that is used for communication for uh, hundreds of years, and if you take a book from, let's say, 19th century, and we take it today and we start to read it, we will actually don't need that much knowledge because we have it uh, already. How to read it? How to use it? What what was the uh, well, I don't know. Even technology used for the uh, prepare, used for the uh, for the creating this book. Uh, this is quite analog and it's quite simple to use even today. Uh, n doesn't matter when when this book basically was published. Well, roughly doesn't matter. But if we take uh, and my uh, very um, uh, favorite case of uh, uh, one of the digital mapping projects uh, that was quite uh, visionary. Um, in digital humanities in the beginning of uh, 20, 21st century called uh, Manhattan Time Formations. It's, it was one of the first uh, conceptual visions how to use digital technology, digital mapping in order to map urban infrastructures and make it uh, in a temporal way so you can have the, you can see the dynamic of changes in this infrastructure. But it was made on Flash. On Flash technology that is not used uh, basically today and it's uh, really difficult to access the, 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 the map that was done in 2001st. Uh, it's basically today it's almost unaccessible, so the sustainability and durability, longevity of this, of this project is not that uh, present. And it took only, I don't know, 10 or 15 years to, 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 uh, to, to to make this technology outdated. So my question would be about the temporality, sustainability, facilitation of this kind of technology that is AR and VR, because as far as I know, there are two basic platforms for virtual technology, virtual reality, like Unity and something else, as far as I know. And, uh, and, those, uh, and those technologies are also commercially based. Uh, these are commercial companies, and as, as, as well as, uh, as Flash technology, for example. And uh, durability of this technology is something that is often, uh, well, questionable, criticized in the matter of discussion. So uh, my, uh, I'm just curious, what is your uh, perspective towards that? What would you see was, uh, could happen with VR and AR technology, let's say, in 10 or 15 years? How it, uh, sustainable would be? And especially in terms of digital humanities as well. I mean, of course, I don't know, let's say some, uh, some Microsoft company could, uh, could facilitate their um, you know, VR projects. I'm not sure Microsoft has a VR project, but uh, let's say they have, and, uh, and if, if it's a commercial company and it's commercially driven, then we can see how it, uh, well, company uh, basically has some vision how to, uh, how to facilitate and make it sustainable for a longer perspective. But what, what, uh, what would happen if we go to academia, if we go to digital humanities, how virtual reality, uh, augmented reality as a technology could be sustainable for this kind of project for a longer uh, uh, period, for a longer perspective. And the third one, uh, to the project that is related to, to uh, Pinzel AR, and here, um, actually, uh, from the very beginning of this presentation, I had this question about, uh, uh, if the previous one was about temporality, this one is about spatiality, rather, because uh, for me, and it was almost answered, basically a lot of, uh, a lot of cases were presented that were answers to my question, but I still want to, to highlight it and to, to see your perspective on the, on the spatiality of uh, this heritage that you, uh, that you digitize and you later on present in different kind of uh, um, spaces, basically. Because space for me is not only something three-dimensional, space is also something that has uh, 
Oh, I don't know, social dimension as well. I mean, if uh, the sculpture itself is something that you uh, basically have experience with in with all your senses, not only visually, but also, I mean, sound of the space where this, um, uh, acoustics of the space where the statue uh, sculpture is, is also something that is important for the, uh, uh, for the experiencing this sculpture, lights, uh, I don't know, other people within the room and everything. So once you take the, uh, once you take the sculpture, sculpture out of its space and you put it in this white uh, box and uh, scanning and doing this uh, photogrammetry uh, uh, scanning and then uh, publishing it, uh, it basically makes the sculpture out of the space where it is, uh, where it belongs or where it is at the moment. Uh, well, actually, the sculptures were taken out of uh, churches so and put in, in the museum. So uh, this was another case when the sculpture itself was, the space for this sculpture was uh, uh, was uh, was changed. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, this is something that you mentioned about this personal distance. So this personal distance is really important when you try to experience the sculpture. And, uh, mm, and in some cases, as you mentioned, you do these 3D models with uh, uh, with the 3D printing uh, that helps you somehow to see the texture, see the uh, not only 3D model but also uh, the, the space where it works and especially if it's a scale one to one then it uh, uh, somehow helps but it, at the same time it doesn't or whether it, it, it shows any materiality of the, of the sculpture because it's wooden sculpture and it's also important to see this uh, wooden material, wood as material for this sculpture, light that reflects, uh, that this wood reflects and everything. So um, I'm just curious, or maybe you can uh, uh, also elaborate more on this uh, idea of speciality of the sculpture that you, uh, uh, that you digitize and scan and publish later on. Thank you. Thank you, Taras. It's uh, not only questions, but extensive explanations also. But uh, since we are running out of time, I, I'd like to collect maybe a few more questions and then uh, we go for the coffee break. If there are some questions, then we add to the last question and, and then we'll continue. Thank you all. Bye. Right. I have one question for Alexei and one for uh, Jean. Alexei, are you claiming that it's, it's a bit following up um, Taras' question? Are you claiming that the very structure of VR as a medium allows us to bypass propaganda? In that sense, it wouldn't be possible to do propaganda on VR if you follow this kind of, uh, kind of thought. So, because uh, to me, it seems that it's, it's um, if anything, VR makes it makes even more powerful the effect of reality. Uh, so it's more of an ethical question than a, a technical or technological one. And I think that you kind of emphasize that as well when you say that you're not creating a video game, but a um, uh, documentary. So I would like, to, to, I would like you to, to expand on that. And Jean, um, I guess that you told, you told us more about the um, technical limits than the real pitfalls of such a technology. Um, and you started your speech by saying that you would tell us about what it is possible to do now and what it is not possible to do yet. So do you think that from an ontological point of view, in the end, uh, digital will be everywhere? And, and do you think that, well, my question would be, is there not a pitfall here? churches and were taken out of the church context. And you scan churches. At some point you would probably come to the situation when you scan the church where the sculpture that you scanned was taken from. And have you ever considered reconstructing the original context by joining the models? It would be even the correct thing to do. Then we will have virtual reality more real than real reality. <laughs> this um, okay, so I'll start with, uh, with uh, your question. Um, I actually, no, I don't think so. I don't think virtual reality makes propaganda impossible. I think that virtual reality is a powerful medium. 
um, or anything. Um, so it's like a, it's like saying cell phone. When you say cell phone, you know it can be anything. You can do whatever. That's that's the thing with virtual reality. So what we use it for um, was a virtual reality documentary. That one one of the aims of this virtual reality documentary was to deconstruct myths. But hey, virtual reality is such a powerful tool for propaganda. Oh my, you know, um, you could almost do uh, like anti aftermath VR Euro Maidan, and then use all of these claims that the Russian propaganda was making, move things a little bit, hey, you know, and then uh, you you got uh, you know a completely distorted message. Um, so um, and also. Um, well, I mean, what I like about um, virtual reality is that a um, couple things. It only happens inside a headset, so it's really it's not a photograph and not a video. So it's hard to cut into pieces. It's hard to recontextualize. You know, it's hard to take our project and then say something like cut it into pieces and use in whatever context. So it's a very it's a very kind of piece in itself, and the magic only happens um, if, if you're in a headset. If, and if you're not, then it's not, it's not existent. Um, and about your question, uh, yes, virtual reality is hardly, ex is hardly accessible, and that is a challenge. Um, and that is a challenge, and I think we are very, very slowly moving towards it being more accessible. But it's also a story not about quantity, but about quality of, of the impression that we make. And uh, yes, I completely agree <coughs> with a couple of things. First, that what we do in Ukraine is more reactional than proactional. But I think although this project is somewhat reactional, it's also very proactional in terms of creating a whole new narrative. Um, and an, another thought, um, despite the fact that a lot of Russian propaganda was created back then, like five years ago, it was an influx, it was a wave, just like sh like shit wave of stuff that was just killing us. Um, and, that, and that led to a lot of, uh, uh, that practically led to an armed conflict in Ukraine, like all of that. Um, but the problem with it is that it's still there. I was very interested, and I didn't include that, but it was it was also very good what Russia Today did. I was like, I haven't watched actually Russia Today and their coverage of the Euromaidan revolution. Oh, it was bad. Uh, you know, it, I thought it would be, but it was, I think, even even worse than I expected. Um, and it's still there. Like, if, if a person anywhere in the globe decides to go and read about it, he or she will see it. Um, so, one of, the, one of the things that I think the project accomplishes to do is that it tells the story in, in an in-depth fashion to people who have heard about it, but actually don't know much about it. So we've, we've had a lot of um, feedback from people who have seen flat footage mm -hmm. across the world, and they're like, oh, I've seen the flat footage, I recognize the square. Oh, I didn't know that the square was so big. Oh, I didn't know that this and that. And imagine sometimes I still hear from people who, who I would really, really think know what happened. People are telling me, oh, but we still don't know who shot them, right? And I'm like, how on earth? You know, having all that content out there, having gigabytes of footage, how do you not know? But you will still meet these people. So I think, um, yes, in terms of um, accessibility, it's not a great story, but then there is that uh, sort of uh, yeah. does it. That does a that does a great job, and that is really accessible. And <laughs> does it something actually very similar to what we're doing? It's just not a it's not a physical impression, but it's a it's a great multimedia project. So I think every project um, it's never enough to be honest to uh, do projects about 2014. Okay, so thanks, Tash, for your question. Thanks, Simon, for yours. Um, I think I'll go the other way around, starting to answer yours. Um, uh, basically, uh, about the temporal persistence, if you like, of these kind of experiences, right? Um, and you mentioned Flash. I'm not going to discuss that tech, but Flash is a kind of early interactive tech, and you have this um, user when people just jump on it and start producing stuff that things are not standardized yet, and you know it's, it's kind of tricky. So. I think we've reached uh, more maturity in this, so it's a bit like uh, photographic information, so that you have like well-documented open image formats. 
so that also digital ima images can be read. Um, so for instance, also there's PDF archive, right? This archival format um, where this, they guarantee a kind of at least a century of readability and it's open format. And uh, we're moving pretty much there. So 3D assets have these open formats, right? So, um, and also in, in the context of AR, they, um, apart from being a 3D asset, they have a specific um, position and orientation that's coded in there. And what might uh, get lost is basically this kind of um, the application in which they were embedded, right? But then uh, from an academic point of view, obviously you publish on this and all the methods that you've been using, and th that could be um, that this has to be ported eventually to a new technology, but all the assets, the production and the, like the, the theory behind it would still persist. Um, and, uh, but it, it happens with static images, it happens with film, so that you basically um, have to, you know, digitize it. Eventually, maybe we will digitize <laughs> Redigitize they are, you know, um, but there is there is this idea, um, and specifically like coming from academia, you have this this idea that this is should be something persistent, right? Um, yeah, and again, standardization efforts are food, and that they, they are basically the the concentrated effort that has been put into this. But that leads leads also a bit to this. So I, it's true. Um, I was discussing more technical pitfalls, so uh, questioning the technology as such. Um, like with any new technology um, that has the potential to proliferate, you know, for all our lives, um, this is a kind of philosophical and ethical discussion um, that we have to lead. Um, currently, the, the most discussed technology is AI. How we use it, um, you know, will it just uh, dominate everything, um, every aspect of our lives? You know, will it judge our credibility, uh, our credit worthiness in the financial sense, etc. So I wouldn't say, um, okay, I have a technological te technology background, but uh, I wouldn't say that um, technology or new developments are this or that per se. I wouldn't call a new technology a pitfall. I think it's on us to um, decide how can we employ this technology in valuable ways? Um, how can we make sure that people who want to opt out are not excluded by opting out? And I think that's more the, the, the question that we have to deal with. And um, fortunately, because um, AI, and specifically VR, um, have a very high level of immersion, and they, they really kind of make us believe uh, being at a specific spot, or, you know, it's, it's actually, a, they have a more direct central cha <coughs> channel to us. Um, I see that these questions are being discussed and thought through um, while developing stuff. So I've seen also people stopping research because they think that's the wrong direction to take, right? But essentially, if you wish to and you want to augment um, context with some, some really in-depth experience uh, to enrich understanding, you know, I think that's, that's a good way to go. But you always have to consider this at the back. I wouldn't consider it a pitfall per se. Again, it's, you can also see it as a potential, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's both, right? And uh, again, you have to be aware of this. And just to conclude, maybe your first question, that was the plenary question about um, virtual reality now versus um, essentially uh, any books or any other medium that is equally immersive or was equally immersive. So the technical um, or the definition of virtual reality is essentially that it places you in a simulated environment that makes you believe that you're part of it. Okay, so um, as such, that would be a three-dimensional environment where you can move around and feel that you're part of it. Um, obviously, if you are so much into, uh, let's say, a film, I mean, I'm, I'm probably the first kind of cinematographic experiences that people had, they, uh, I remember it, it was, you know, the train that the, I think yeah, the brothers in right, were right. people were just screaming and running out there. So my personal opinion, uh, aside from the definition, is that yes, also non-HMD, uh, experiences can be VR. It depends on the level of immersion. Um, and VR is just a means of transferring you there. So that's what I guess, yes. Yeah. Для мене питання з простором і це речі питання не про простір, а про місце. Тобто 
svi smo ti reći, one vzene je, one v tomu funkcionalnem prostoru, kde one narodili se, se zde, kde one byly prezначeny, krem toho one někde zovsím v jiném prostoru, kde one vzene takými sakrálními, tak, kde one nemají toho stavení, one nemají toho, že my se odtud vyjde, kde prostě one vyneseny в інший простір, і ми не намагаємося створити, тобто ми працюємо ніби з гіперреальністю якогось цього конкретного унікального об'єкту, але ми не намагаємося реальність повторити. Тобто в цьому смислу немає, але ми бачимо, наскільки складно цю реальність. Тобто реальність відтворити дуже важко, тому виртуальна дійсність, вона все одно все на початках, тобто вона, це розуміння умовності, яке вона дає, дуже явно. І ми це не приховуємо, ми просто намагаємося зрозуміти, як оця нова технологія може справді доповнити оце місце, наприклад, музей Кінзеля, який є зараз там розвалений, ну, в дуже поганому стані, скульптури в дуже погано відекспонувані, наративи дуже приховані, тобто цього всього нема, тобто це все ніби якась така знову збиральна річ, коли ти намагаєшся ці всі різні голоси включити. Тобто те, що ми робимо, це радше намагання знайти діалог. І ми в цей звісно діалог включаємо те, в якому місці воно є, в яких місцях воно було, як воно функціонувало. Але ми просто про це говоримо, ми це ніби не намагаємося якось тут коригувати. Щодо питання, як правило, також всі ті місця, звідки вони були забрані, тобто вони врятовані. Вони вже також всі майже розвалені. Це така елемент спадщини. Власне, що є спадщина. От, наприклад, там до сховища картинна галерея, і все одно, чи в Національному музею, там тьма якихось речей. Це ніби спадщина. Але спадщина, це, власне, вона стається і задіюється, і, власне, реанімується. От тоді, коли ми беремо, ми це виймаємо, і ми це робимо цю додаткову якусь дію щодо цього. Тоді вона стає вже ніби цією активною, оперативною спадщиною. Тому, що не знаю, чи ви хочете об'єкти помістити віртуальні у віртуальні? Ну, так, Роман про це казав. Ми, в принципі, це такий цікавий виклад, зрозуміти, як загалом буде відбуватися оце, наскільки це можна відтворити, скажімо так, до ладно, добре. Тому що можна помістити, воно буде там, як... Тобто питання також не в тому, щоб відтворити той повністю інтер'єр, а в тому, щоб оце індивідуальне сприйняття було достатньо цілісним і для людини, яка так буде користатися цим цим окуляром чи цим шовцем, щоб воно було для нього достатньо промовити. Тому ефект для людини, яким ми хочемо створити, стоїть перед нами також. Дякую всім за цю цікаву сесію. Ми маємо час на 30 хвилин для рефрешментів і кофе.